This party calls with strangeness. Therefore, they can decay into other particles only with violation of strangeness, right? of initial state is 1 and strangeness of final state is 0. So we deal here with violation of strangeness. So again the concept is that uh, strangeness is conserved or good quantum number of strong interactions and electromagnetic. But strangeness is broken by weak interactions. This process is due to weak interactions. S is broken in the weak interactions. Also remember we had observed decay of uh, strangeness into muon and neutrino and here in final state non-strange particle. So it's not strange that this decay is quite slow. What is really interesting that although in final state we have two strongly interacting particles and this is also strongly interacting particle because number of produced k chaos is comparable with number of produced pines in the cosmic rays, but it decays due to weak interactions. And that happens because in this decay you have violation of strangeness. Strong interactions conserve strangeness, and therefore this process cannot go while strong interactions. Weak interactions do not conserve strangeness, and therefore this process uh, go through the uh, weak interactions. So let me summarize. Strangeness. is conserved in strong interactions, and also electromagnetic, but it's broken in the weak interactions. So you see here the concept is that different uh, interactions have different symmetries because all these quantum numbers eventually are related to the symmetries and different interactions have different conservation laws. So bottom line is that K mesons are produced in strong interactions, in interactions of Cosmic rays, protons, neutrons, heavier, some, some nuclei, with nuclei of atmosphere, and this occurs due to strong interactions. And they are produced in pairs, so this is why, uh, why we can satisfy conservation of strangeness. So in uh, cosmic rays, which are also non-strange particles, most of them are non-strange particles, like proton, nuclei, they are not strange particles. Nuclei in atmosphere also have zero strangeness. And therefore strange particles like K-mesons are produced in pairs so that you can satisfy conservation of, uh, of strangeness in this way. However, they decay due to weak interaction because they can decay only into light particles, lighter than K-meson, and those have no strangeness. So this is the way how things are explained. Of course, later people observed 
uh, heavier strange particles. Like, for instance, uh, K star with the mass 892 MeVs. This is in MeVs. And that can decay into K meson and, uh, and pi. And this decay strangeness is conserved because we have also K meson but not with stars, so this is kind of, you can consider as an excited state if you want of this particle. It decays into K meson, so strangeness, say one is here, strangeness one is here, and strangeness is conserved in this decay. This decay occurs very quickly, and the lifetime uh, is 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So also later, these particles K mesons, like the pi mesons, they are mesons, so they have uh, zero speed. But later particles with semi-integer speed have been di uh, discovered, which are analogies of proton and neutron, and for instance, a lambda hyperon has been discovered, which can decay into another strange particle plus pi. And the lifetime of this decay is 10 to the minus 23, 23 seconds. Compare with 10 to the minus 8 for K decay. The story with this K decay actually repeated several times, and this is the way we introduced charm or bottomness, so beauty and, and, and top quantum numbers. Questions? Just one question. This strange number is just one or minus one? Oh, zero also. Yeah. Also oh, zero. Also. <laughs> now, I don't remember that if you have uh, particles with strangeness. Uh, well, in principle, you may have a, a, a higher strangeness also. But most of the particles have this uh, zero, plus, and minus. Yeah, you, you may have uh, particles with strangeness too, also. Well, you can have a a, a systems with, with a big strangeness, of course. That's always, uh, this is additive quantum number. If you the system can be here. Another question if this is elementary particle or how <laughs> this particle is elementary. We come to this when we will discuss quark structure of, of, of hadrons. Then you see, yes, uh, you may have uh, even higher strangeness. There are particles with strangeness, uh, 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 with strangeness three even. More questions? Again, let me repeat. The strangeness is that something is produced in strong interactions, or can be produced in strong, strong interactions, but decay due to weak interaction. That was strange. That was unusual. A usual situation that if some, something uh, can uh, be produced in strong interactions, it also has a strong interaction decay. And there are two circumstances now, two uh, facts which explain this. One is that you introduce new quantum number, and the second one that K mesons are the lightest strange particles. So let me get K mesons. Are the lightest strange particles. which means that they can decay into lighter particles, and therefore they can decay only into non-strange particles. 
So you have violation of strangeness in these decays. You then have, so you, you have conservation of strangeness in the production process because you can produce pairs of strange particles. But individual particle with strangeness, the lightest one, can decay only into non-strange particles. It can decay only in the particles which are lighter, but since there is no lighter strange particles, therefore the lightest strange particle decays only uh, due to weak, in this case, interactions. Well, there are more strange things with this strange particle. So, let us consider the theory of KDP. And let us consider leptonic K decay and K go to mu and mu mu. What is interesting that apart from this decay, which is analogy of pine decays, also decays of the following type have been found. K go to pi nu E and E and also pi and mu mu and mu. So, in the first case, state K is transformed to vacuum. In the second case, you have K transformed into the state of pi. So, in both cases, you have, of course, violation of, uh, of strangeness. So, let us focus on this decay. And this is quite similar to what we discussed for pines. Also here we have appearance of the pair of leptons. So if it is plus, let me put plus, and it is new. And this decay, we can assume again, by analogy is what we have studied for pines, that a lepton pair is produced due to existence of leptonic current or oh, this appearance product lepton pair production is due to leptonic current And we can assume that this is the same current, again, for minimality and simplicity, as we met already in pi and decay. So that looks like uh, nu, gamma nu. And again, let me write what we have already now. Sorry. Minus gamma phi. Uh, and mu. So this current describes appearance of neutrino. This is with Dagger, right? With Dirac conjugate. And absorption of mu or production of mu plus, anti mu. Now we need also to introduce something which describes these transitions. And again, we, using, we are using analogy and thinking that probably these decays are described by the product of two currents. One of these currents is this one, this is leptonic current. And now we need to introduce another current, which is a strange current. Now 
Now, for time being, we don't know precisely what is the structure of this current, but we can just do introducing something general. And this current is responsible for these transitions, K meson to vacuum state or K meson into, into pipe state. So we introduce strange current. And now the Hamiltonian, which is responsible for, for the first decay, is G. And now let me write in general S, which is strange interaction, square root of 2. Just analogy what we had before. And the product of two currents, leptonic current, here and strange current the index mean here strange current plus your mission on GP. So it's product of two currents. I just put here this is uh, this is uh, conjugate. So this uh, mu and mu here so uh, Lorentz invariance are, is okay. Leptonic current is written here, and I put L because we also have electron and electron neutrino current, which is responsible or participates in this process. Also, there is of course decay when you have pi new mu and the mu, and uh, so again you need to put somewhere like this. Uh, depending on charge, so you can put mu plus mu plus. So not only, uh, let me write, so uh, not only here it should be uh, uh, electron current, but also muon current. So let me write here that L equals E, and it, it can be mu. So in fact we have here additional terms. One is with electron neutrino and uh, uh, electron, another one with muon neutrino and muon. And let me remind you again that Hamiltonian is an uh, additive quantity and therefore eventually we need to sum up all these terms which we have introduced to describe particular interactions. Okay. Question? Now, what is this GS? Measuring the rates or lifetimes of these processes, and knowing the form of the Hamiltonian, we can perform computations of the uh, decay rates. Decay rates will be proportional to Gs squared, so measuring decay rates or lifetimes, we can measure what is Gs. So, can you guess what, what is Gs? So before we have introduced, remember, G Fermi, and it was G beta decay, which, and milk, which is practically the same as uh, uh, G pi, and this is practically the same or close to G mu. We discussed mu decay, discussed pi decay, and beta decay. So. What is this GS? Remember, we, just, we just, uh, introduced already several parts of the total Hamiltonian which are responsible for different processes like beta decay, pi decay, muon decay, and they appeared as a terms with GS, and with, sorry, with some G uh, coupling constant which was practically the same for all these processes. And I have mentioned already universality and uh, equality of uh, effective coupling constants in all these processes 
is manifestation of universality of weak interaction. So they occur with the same four fermion coupling constant. Now, can you guess what is this GS? And the inverse of the mass square? Well, some mass square, yeah, but yeah. is this the same as G Fermi or not? It should be like, of course, they have all the same dimension because they have the same, uh, enter the, uh, the, the Hamiltonians of, of the same structure, current times current, and then it has a dimension one over the mass square. So my question is, again, the following. In all previous cases, we have these four fermion couplings, which are practically the same in muon decay, in pi decay, and uh, in, uh, in beta decay. Now we are discussing K decay. And again, we introduce four fermion couplings. So is this, again, the same? Do we have universality here or not? Non-trivial thing, huh? Oh, so uh, these are also very different processes, beta decay and, for instance, muon decay. In beta decay, we have proton and neutron transition. In muon decay, we have all leptons. Those are, of course, very different. And also here, for we have also leptonic current. You see, this is the same as actually participates in muon decay. So we assume, and the same as participates in pi decay. So this muon current is responsible for, for pi decay. Remember, we discussed last lecture. It's also responsible for muon decay. And see, here we meet again some qualitatively important and new situation. So what happened that this GS is not equal and substantially different from fermion G. So the easiest way to measure GS and see how many consequences will come from this. Uh, we can measure GS comparing the rate of K decay into neutrino and muon and decay of pi into mu, uh, mu and mu. Okay. So, this ratio of rates is proportional to Gs squared. That is because gamma is proportional to Gs squared over G pi or G fermi squared. Multiplied by kinematical factors. which actually reflect the difference of masses of K meson and pi. Of course, you will have different uh, phase space when you do integration over, over momenta. This you can compute once you know, uh, once you know masses and you know the masses. And therefore, and you know also rates, you measure this. And in this way, you can find what is, what is this ratio. What has been found is that GS square over gf square and f is the same for pi, right? And this is 0 0.05, 20 times smaller. It's 20 times smaller. So it looks like you have violation of uh, universality. So that's something which is uh, 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 strange again. So the strange particle has many strange things. What is important that this 
observation, this result allowed or kind of forced to introduce concept of mixing. Mixing of, had mixing of currents, then mixing of hadrons, and mixing of quarks. So, this result, this very important result, leads to introduction of mixing. Mixing of currents and eventually of quarks. And mixing of quarks. Well, what has been found actually that G mu for fermionic coupling responsible for muon decay is approximately, it's a little bit bigger than the coupling which is responsible for pi and decay and it turned out that this is equal to G pi plus G s squared. Of course, this is small quantity, it's just 5%, so in the first approximation you have this equality, but if you measure precisely you will find that, in fact, this is slightly bigger than G pi, and uh, it turns out that uh, 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 this equality is satisfied. So this is also uh, like G beta, so they are the same. So this is G s and this is G Fermi. Now, to describe this, you can introduce mixing angle. So, this is what eventually we call now G Fermi. Now, G pi is G Fermi multiplied by cosine theta. Let me put Habiba. And here we describe as G Fermi multiplied by sine theta Habiba. And theta, theta C is Kabibo angle, Kabibo mixing angle. As usual in history of, uh, of, uh, of uh, physical science, uh, this angle was not introduced by Kabibo, but its name is <laughs> Kabibo angle, so it was introduced even before Kabibo papers. But anyway, so that's what we call uh, Kabibo angle, who actually made uh, a developed phenomenology of this mixing phenomenon. So, we, this is kind of reparameterization, right? So we introduce new parameters. Um, instead of different uh, G uh, coupling constants, and clearly this expression is, uh, uh, this equality is satisfied because here we have gf squared, here is gf squared cosine squared, this is gf squared sine squared, and they sum up and you will satisfy this, this relation. With this, we can write the Hamiltonian in more symmetric form, in a sense, a more universal form than just writing different parts separately with different couplings. This is, to some extent, is just a rewritten way. So it's G Fermi square, square root of 2. Um, now, electronic current, and here we can write cosine theta Kadibo. G mu pi plus sine theta cabibo G mu s. So we just combined two terms 
uh, of the Hamiltonian. One is responsible for pi and decay, another is responsible for strange particle decays like a kern uh, in this form. So, so that we introduce uh, a unique current here, which is the sum of two currents. And in this way, we write uh, Hamiltonian in kind of universal form, but of course by price of introduction of uh, uh, Kabiba parameter, or Kabiba mixing. Sine theta Kabiba should be just square root of all these, right? And this is approximately 0.22. So, as I said, Kabibo angle and mixing of currents. So, what we have here is mixing of current. This is what we call mixing of current. Has been introduced even before Kabibo by Gelman and Levy. And also by Sakata. In a sense, this is trivial reparameterization, but you will see just, just similar, uh, this simple rewriting of the things actually will lead to very deep fundamental principle of mixing of quarks and, and also leptons. You will see this. And here, by the way, L, I have written L. L is E uh, mu. So we have two different leptonic currents, muon and muon neutrino, electron and electron neutrino. And uh, so actually, we need to sum up over L and add Hermitian conjugate, right? Plus Hermitian conjugate. So you see, we slowly build up the Hamiltonian and eventually almost could be close to the standard model Hamiltonian. And I want again to underline, so this is the way how the theory appeared, emerged from the experimental observations. So now we have Hamiltonian, which can be written as GF square root of two, leptonic current multiplied by hadronic current and hadronic current is a mixture of uh, non-strange and strange currents. That's cosine theta kabiba. This is current uh, which is I have denoted pi mu plus sine the Kabibo multiplied by current for strange particles. So you see we have mixing of uh, G pi current and G s current with this mixing parameter inside or in the hadronic current. In a sense we kind of uh, restore at least universal form of the interaction with unique coupling by the price of introducing another parameter, which is mixing parameter. From here, later, we will introduce mixing of quarks. That will lead eventually to introduction of mixing of quarks.
So you see, whole history is that we have observed new particle K, K meson. We have studied decay of this particle. And then we assume that Hamiltonian has a similar form to that what we have already introduced from for beta decay and for prime decay with some four fermion coupling. And then again, measurements of the rates show that four fermion coupling in the processes with strange particle differs from what we had for non-strange particle. Then we still want to have nice look of our Hamiltonian, and we write this in this way. But then we need to introduce another parameter, which actually describes difference of uh, four fermion couplings in uh, different decays. That led us to mixing of currents, first of all. And that was widely used in so-called current algebra some techniques developed in the, uh, in the beginning of 60s at the end of 50s. Now, of course, we are using mostly so the quark level, things at the quark level. And then eventually that led to the introduction of mixing quark, of quarks, which we have, we'll discuss later. So you see, this particle K meson is really very important. And eventually we will see that K mesons are particles which contain new quarks. So, in a sense, the discovery of K-mesons is discovery of a new type of the quarks. Another very important discovery, uh, uh, which we will discuss later in the last part of the course, is that some strange game properties of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of K meson essentially led to discovery of parity violation. Discovery of parity violation. So this is so called theta tau problem. I just denoted and we will discuss this later. And this theta and Tau eventually turn out to be K mesons. And properties of this T and Tau led to concept of parity violation. That happened in 56. And parity violation effects finally led us to necessity to introduce this gamma 5 structure. So V minus A, what we call, what we are writing here is gamma mu multiplied by 1 minus gamma 5. That has been introduced after discovery of parity violation. But we will discuss this in the last part of the course. Another thing, not only parity, but also CP violation first has been discovered in, proper, in studies of properties of K meson. You see, a single particle actually led to introduction of concept of mixing, the concept of uh, parity violation, and CP violation. And CP violation has been discovered in the decays of K mesons, studies of decays of K mesons into two pines and to three pines led to discovery of CP symmetry violation. That's just a single particle, how important it is. And of course, uh, eventually, uh, uh, what is behind these K mesons is discovery of strange quark. So now let me discuss discovery of neutrinos.
So you made these estimations of cross-section of uh, uh, neutrino interaction. This is what Beta and Piles did in 30s. And the cross-section was so small that you need astronomical size of layers of water to have probability of interaction one. So in 30s, people saw that neutrinos will be never discovered. Things changed in 40s already. In fact, one of the persons who actually deeply thought how to discover neutrino was Bruno Pontecorvo. Let me start from this. And maybe you know he has a very non trivial life because uh, he was in Italy, then he immigrated uh, from Italy uh, before the Second World War. And then he reappeared in, in, in Soviet Union. And actually he left and uh, he, he was uh, in Soviet Union starting from the uh, 50s uh, till the end of his life. I know him personally. Actually, he was my opponent and my uh, defense of, of, of thesis. So I have various stories with this uh, quite interesting person. Actually, he deserves, of course, Nobel Prize. You, you will see how many things he actually suggested and contributed to the developments of, of the topic. So, Ponte Corvo showed that one can probably, he thought about discovery of new periods. So, another interesting point. I mentioned already that, uh, that uh, uh, Hans Bethe was one of the people who first computed the cross-sections what we have discussed already, right, of neutrino interaction, beta and piles result. What is interesting is that beta suggested the theory of, uh, of the energy of the stars, of how stars produce the energy, and he suggested nuclear reactions inside the, uh, inside the sun, so not only him, but also he suggested one of the important chains of the, of the processes. And what is interesting, if you open the paper by Hans Bethe, the, the one he got Nobel Prize eventually for, you will not find neutrinos in the reactions. So he has written reactions, in particular processes of beta decay, but without neutrino. Can you imagine what was kind of skeptical things? Maybe they exist, maybe not. That looks like a speculative. He, he didn't want even to write neutrinos in the processes of beta decay which occur inside the sun. I was shocked when I, for the first time, saw this chain of the processes, which are right processes which occur inside the, inside the sun, but they were without neutrinos. So in a sense, it was even wrong. I mean, you, you, can, you have lepton number violation and other strange things. Or wrong energy spectrum of particles which are appearing. So even after 20 years, it was still very non-trivial that neutrinos exist as a real particle. People still, so maybe this is something, you know, so why that, that, that strange stuff exists? So why? Anyway. Bruno Ponte Corva actually thought about sources. Of neutrinos. And he discussed, by the way, atomic reactors. But also sun. It turns out that the sun is the source of, uh, of neutrinos, although the Hans Bethe actually missed in his uh, paper neutrinos. And I find it that he didn't even kind of replace or the papers and uh, said, have written something which actually somehow explain or correct these things. Uh, so, the sun is shining because of nuclear reactions, and the neutrinos are produced in these nuclear reactions. So this is one of the important sources of neutrinos. Then it was also Fred Reines who considered nuclear 
explosions as the source of neutrinos. And the first attempt to, to measure neutrinos was, he was trying to measure these neutrinos uh, when it, there were nuclear tests. So, in the uh, 50s, we had new sources of neutrinos, which were not discussed before in the 30s, and new methods of detection of elementary particles. So, detection of neutrinos became possible because of creation of atomic reactors, which produce huge fluxes of neutrino and also new methods of detection. And creation of big detectors, not small, not table type of, uh, say, 15 centimeters, 16 centimeters, something like this. Here already meters, and now we have 100 meters or kilometer size of the detectors to detect neutrinos. So let me give you some information about uh, 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 reactors and, uh, and, uh, and new methods of the detection. So, inside reactors, we have heavy elements and we have fission of these elements. Actually, under, under action of neutrons. So, we have uranium-235. Uranium two three what eight plutonium two three nine and plutonium two four uh, one. Essentially two uh, these four elements. There are some research reactors, so this is commercial reactors, they usually have all this fluid. In some uh, small size uh, research reactors, uh, they can have pure this uranium-235. So what happens, you have this nuclei, usually under action of neutrons, this nuclei is split. The final projects, uh, products are usually also unstable and they continue to split more and more. So what happens is, you can understand if you look at the, if you look at the stability range in the plane of number of protons, and number of neutrons in a given nuclei. So here are the lightest nuclei like deuterium, helium, and uh, these elements are in the end of the brain. So what happens is that stability range in this plane has not a straight line, but it turns at a large number of particles inside the nuclei. So here we have elements very stable like, uh, like carbon, oxygen. They have equal number of protons and neutrons. So it's kind of more or less linear stuff. But then here in the heavy elements, the number of neutrons is bigger, much bigger than the number of protons. And this is clear because you have also more protons there, and they have repulsive forces. And when you have ma too many protons, so uh, it's difficult to keep a uh, stability. So this is stability band. So 
stability band in the, in the plane, uh, well, number of protons and neutrons. And so elements, uranium and plutonium, are here. Now, if you have fission of these heavy elements, you create lighter elements. So suppose you start from here, and for example, suppose you split your nuclei into equal parts. So which means that you are somewhere here. So you will have two nuclei with this number of protons and neutrons, right? And certainly, along this line of equal number of protons, uh, sorry, uh, along this line, you are departing from stability band. Right? Stability band is here, but you have some nuclei in final state which are overloaded by neutrons. So here you have nuclei. Overloaded. By neutrons. in comparison with what is in this uh, stability band. Okay? Which means that you produce here unstable or highly unstable nuclei, which then decay, and what happens is uh, neutrons decay, and you have the chain of the decays, to reach stability band. So what will happen in the nuclei? Well, actually, you have various fissions. You may sit down here or here. Right? So one nuclei can be here, another one is here. So you are moving along this line when you split your, your nuclei. But you always are apart from stability band. Just for exercise, take uranium-238 uh, and uh, divide it's in two equal parts. And so you will have something and uh, that will be 100, what is 19. Uh, and uh, so see also what is the number of protons. And that nuclei will be extremely unstable. It will be extremely unstable with respect to uh, beta decay. And so what will happen? Neutrons in this nuclei, which are overloaded by nuclei decay, in our usual way. And so the nuclei with n x, so the n is number of nuclei, will be transformed in the nuclei with n and the charge x plus 1 plus E minus plus new anti electron anti So what will happen that nuclei, and here you will have two nuclei, so each of them will suffer from beta decay, and in this way you will have a change, this is total of number of nucleons. Total number. to say now sum of the proton and the neutron number, and what will happen is the electric charge of the nuclei increases by one, and then you have emission of electrons and electron antineutral. So that's what happens after fission of, uh, of, uh, of nuclei. And one can count how many decays is needed to reach stability. And it turned out that in average, you need to have six decays. Six, the chain of six beta decays. To reach stability band.
This means that each fusion creates six antineutrinos. An average. Of course, you have different splits, and in some cases, you have more and some less. Uh, but an average, it's uh, six neutrinos. Antineutrinos. Another important point is that in this decays you produce antineutrino. This is important. I haven't introduced yet a uh, lepton number. So lepton number, as we will see later, is conserved. Therefore, if you have electron here, then it should be accompanied by electron antineutrino. Positron would be accompanied by neutrino, and therefore, since we have increase of charge of the particle, of nuclei in this decays, and therefore emission of electrons, therefore neutrino, which appears in this decay, should be antineutrino. Therefore, atomic reactors are producing fluxes of antineutrinos. So, Well, still there is some small flux of neutrinos because among the decays there are also uh, beta plus decays. And uh, in this case, uh, 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 you have emission of neutrino. This flux is, uh, is, uh, is also detected, but it's much, much smaller than the flux of electron antineutrinos. So, this is one important point. Another important point is how to find the flux. So, flux of neutrinos can be estimated knowing thermal power of the reactor. So, we have the case. And in this case, what happens? N new nuclei are produced. Electrons are produced. Some of these nuclei uh, have... Uh, uh, are in excited state and therefore eventually they produce gamma and also there is a kinetic energy of nuclei all this leads to release of thermal energy So we measure this in thermal power of, uh, of reactor. On the other hand, in the same beta decay, you produce neutrinos or antineutrino fluxes, right? Produce antineutrino fluxes. So knowing thermal power, you can find how many decays you need to have this release of thermal power. And therefore, you can find what is the total flux of antineutrinos. And in each decay, uh, so in each chain, we will have six antineutrinos, right? So, uh, 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 doing this estimation, you can find what is the flux of neutrinos. This is the way how to estimate total flux of neutrinos. And... Uh, what has been found is that this F total is 2, 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second multiplied by thermal power over 1 gigawatt. So this is gigawatt. So, measure thermal power of your reactor, you can estimate what is the flux of, uh, of antineutrinos produced. Important parameter uh, characteristic is energy spectrum.
So I will explain this and we will, we will, we will stop at, at, at this point. So energy spectrum. And I'm discussing this in some details because uh, uh, these reactor experiments, reactor neutrino experiments are, are still continuing and in future we will have uh, uh, a number of uh, reactor experiments. There are two ways to compute energy spectrum. One, which is called up initial. So to say, starting from the first principles, you know what is initial chemical composition of your uh, reactor fluid, and then compute all possible chains of the decays, and the number of these branches of decays is about 6 which is really non-trivial way to proceed uh, these computations and you see the point is that in each of these beta decay so you will have many different beta decays you have different energy releases in different these beta decays and to find final energy spectrum you need to sum up all the spectra produced in all these processes it's an enormously complicated procedure. The second way is to uh, have inversion of beta decay spectra, uh, of, uh, of electrons. Inversion of electron spectra. So, remember in beta decay you have appearance of the pair, electron and antineutrino, simultaneously. And therefore, in principle, if you measure the spectrum of electrons from your atomic reactor, you can reconstruct the spectrum of antineutrinos. This is much easier, of course. Here you have, uh, of course, some kind of averaging. So, you measure this. and you reconstruct the spectrum of antineutrino because they are appearing from the same processes. Uh, typical form of the spectrum is the following. It's falling down spectrum in the range of MeVs up to say 10 MeVs, this is the energy of neutrino, this is 10 MeVs. Now what you are interested in is the number of events. A number of events, as you remember, is given by, by cross-section multiplied by the flux. Now this is how the flux behave and cross section increases as you made the computation as E neutrino squared. The product of the two dependencies produces for you something like, like this. And this gives you the number of events dependence on energy. So that's sigma multiplied by F. And it has maximum around, say, 3 MeVs. Or between 2 and 3 MeVs. So this is the spectrum of events you are expecting uh, from, from these uh, atomic reactors. Well, I should say that these computations started in the beginning of, uh, I think at the end even of, of uh, 40s, 50s, and still we have problems with computations of the spectrum. And this is very important once you do experiments with these fluxes of neutrinos. And what we have now still, so-called reactor neutrino anomalies. So, you make computations and then compare with experimental results. And experimental results are very precise. We have a huge number of, of neutrino events these days. Uh, 
there are two aspects of this reactor neutrino anomalies. One is that the flux measured is something like 6% below than what is expected. By 6% of uh, theoretical flux. So which means that antineutrino flux disappears somehow. Now the question is, of course, how reliable are computations? Or maybe something happens with neutrino. And one of the explanations that probably our usual neutrinos are converted to something which is not detected, so-called sterile neutrinos. Second anomaly is, again, difference between theoretical and experimental observations. And the ratio of experimental to theoretical, theoretical, to, observ uh, experimental to theoretical is existence of the bump here at around, uh, around 5 MeVs. Which means that we are really not quite well understand what's going on here. So most probably, uh, so it, it's possible that it's still we just uh, not computing correctly, uh, correctly this flux. Questions? This is number of events, right? So flux decreases, flux of neutrino, cross section increases quadratically, and the product has, has a maximum. So again, some of the explanations. That, 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 that peak people are saying bump, most probably uh, has something to do with some uncounted branches of the decay. People are saying that uh, some decays are not accounted quite precisely. This 6% difference, it may still also be uh, the result of our wrong computations. Uh, but maybe again existence of these so-called sterile neutrinos. So another type of neutrinos, not as our usual, but another one which has much, much uh, weaker interaction. Actually Bruno Pontecoro was the one who had introduced these so-called sterile neutrinos. Okay, then if not, then we will continue tomorrow.